Good morning and Shabbat Shalom and welcome. This is Valley Beth Shalom, Torah study for a Shabbos and almost a Yontif morning. Oh, Joined this yeah. morning, I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein with my dear friend and teacher, Rabbi Mark Gelman. Mark, good morning and Hag Sameach and good Shabbos. Thank you, good Shabbos. You just listen. You're a little too joyous today. Oh, it has to be joyous. It's a holiday weekend. I know, yeah. but I, I uh, had Shabbos, it. and then tonight we're going to begin Shavuot, the holiday that celebrates the giving of Torah, the first fruits, the holiday that serves us blintzes, kugel, and ice cream. I added the ice cream part because that's what God gave to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai that very special day some 3,800 years ago. So tonight... We're going to begin the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot, the 50th day following our exodus from Egypt. Shavuot, according to the tradition, we arrive at Mount Sinai. The people prepare themselves. Moses goes up the mountain and he comes down with, that's the question. What did he come down with? What did he come down with? And this is one of the most interesting open questions of the tradition. Because we're talking about what the fancy word in philosophy is revelation. That is a communication from God to the people of Israel, a communication from the realm of the absolute to the realm of the temporal, a communication from the divine to the human. What exactly was in that revelation? What was given to us? So my very, very orthodox cousin would say to me, that God gave all of the Torah. And by that, he means not only the written five books of Moses and all the books of the Bible, but what he calls the oral Torah, the entire rabbinic oral tradition, the entire rabbinic interpretive tradition, so that every aspect of his Jewish life is connected back to God's presence on Mount Sinai that very special day some, so many years ago. And because he reads every law of the tradition as a gift from God, including the rabbinic traditions that interpreted those laws, he sees every one of them as binding on him without compromise. And he gets very impatient with me because I'm a conservative rabbi who believes that human beings have the authority and the power to interpret the tradition. And when times change, to change the tradition. He doesn't understand how my wife could be a rabbi. Because in his tradition, the idea that only men can be rabbis was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And when I point out to him that his daughter is a doctor, and it doesn't say anything in there about that, he says, yes, precisely. It doesn't say she's forbidden, and therefore she's allowed. And we have this argument. So one position is that God gave the entirety of the Jewish tradition on Mount Sinai. It's all divine. Another tradition is more circumspect, which is to say a, a written Torah, and that the oral tradition of the rabbis that followed it is really the creation of a very a group of very wise, we might even say inspired, deeply spiritual, sensitive human beings, who over the, over the course of the centuries have expanded upon the written Torah and given us the Jewish religion we practice, but because those interpretations are human interpretations, it's within our power to change them when circumstances demand that. And I'll, I'll call that just generally a conservative position. And then there's an, or, and a reformed tradition as well, actually. And, and then we would go another step. And there are those who say that what was given on Mount Sinai was the Ten Commandments. And that everything else in Jewish tradition is an interpretation of those Ten Commandments, an application of those Ten Commandments. What does it mean to live out the principles that are articulated in those Ten Commandments? Um, that's what you call an ethical Judaism and a spiritual Judaism, but it's a Judaism that recognizes that it's the creation of a, of a religious culture, of a human community. And then there are those who said the only thing that God gave on Mount Sinai was the first command. That is, God said, Ani anoche, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have no other gods before me. And that everything else in Judaism is an expansion upon that. And then, believe it or not, there is a tradition that said all God said was the first word, anochi, I, meaning I exist. I am with you. I am in the world with you. And everything we created was a response, an echo of that word that said I. And then there's an intriguing interpretation offered by the great Hasidic master Rav Naftali Arapshitz, 
who said, nope, not even the first word, just the first letter. And the first letter of the first word of the Ten Commandments is an Aleph, which as you all know, is a, it's a silent letter. So all God said was, and I quote, unquote, meaning it, there was no content to revelation. It wasn't words and laws and custom and tradition and institution. It's simply the presence of divinity in the world and everything else that we created. Well, we created it as a response to the presence of divinity in the world. And that is an active conversation throughout the generations of the Jewish people. So Rabbi Gelman, you are our resident theologian and philosopher. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. What was given on Mount Sinai? What is authoritative? What needs to change in that tradition? Well, I think the only thing that was given by God was the belief, the statement that Rahav Telerecha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. You, we were made in the image of God, and th therefore every human being has a dignity, a sanctity, which comes from God and not the state. That's, that's what transforms civilization. Up until the Ten Commandments, up until Judaism, the idea was that your rights, your dignity, was a gift to you from the suzerain lord, the, the king, the pharaoh, the the Duke, whatever it was, the, the people who ran the state, they gave you your rights and they could take away your rights. The fundamental revolution in Western civilization was Sinai. When the Jewish people brought to the world the idea, the belief that God created us in God's image, male and female, explicitly male and female. And that notion that we are created in the image of God is the fundament, the keystone when you build an arch in the Roman construction, it all the weight went onto the keystone at the top. It's the foundation stone, the keystone to our entire religious belief structure. We are made in the image of God, and therefore our dignity, our sanctity, our rights come from God and not the state, which means that the state cannot deprive us of those rights. And if it does, it's against the will of God and will eventually and should be eventually overthrown. And that's why America is so phenomenal as a country with all our flaws, because it was founded on that biblical belief. And, and I believe the founders were geniuses and that the, in, in picking that one belief that, you know, we are made, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal and they are endowed by their creator, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And, and in fact, when Jefferson wrote those words at first, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That wasn't his phrase. The phrase in Jefferson's first version of the preamble to the Declaration of Independence was we hold these truths to be sacred. People don't realize that. It was Franklin and the other deists and people who weren't quite as religious. And Jefferson was religious in his own way. And none of them were religious in the self-reflective way that would have said, wait a minute, if I believe all that, what am I doing owning slaves? All right, but that's another discussion for another time. But the point is, the idea that we hold these truths, they, first of all, they aren't self-evident. That was Jefferson's point to Franklin. He said, look, 
What do you mean it's self-evident that we were created in God's image? If anything is not self-evident, that's it. Hobbes and the rest said, you know, homo hominis lupus, each person is the wolf of their neighbor. You know, the, the, the basic thing it looks like is that nobody has any dignity except whatever power you can grab. No. So the belief that people are made in God's image and endowed by that creator God with inalienable rights is a belief. It's a belief that isn't self-evident. And this country was founded on a belief. And that's what makes America great. And that's what makes the Torah great. And they, these Protestants, they discovered that. Yes, they didn't discover its full implications, that it also meant black people and LGBTQ people. It, it meant everybody. It meant women. It meant everybody. And so that's what I believe Revelation was about. Now, beyond that, all the other laws of the Torah fall into two categories for me. One, laws that only apply to Jews, meaning you can't universalize these laws. They're not for anyone but us. It's not that we're better or worse. These are just our laws. Our holidays, tomorrow night is Shavuos for Jews. I mean, it is Pentecost for Christian, but it's a different thing. So, those are ritual laws, meaning they can't be universalized. And the second kind of laws in the Torah and in the post-Torah laws of the rabbinic Judaism, second type of laws are moral laws, which obviously are the laws that can be universalized. So in the Ten Commandments, you know, you have laws which are arguably just for us. The Sabbath, for example, although it could be for everyone. But you have laws like don't murder. It's not that Jews shouldn't murder, but it's okay for everyone else. No, everyone should not murder. No one should murder another person. Why? Because we're created by God with its sanctity. So, so my view is that ritual laws, the ones that apply to us Jews as only us, those laws can, with historical perspective and with due regard for the tradition, can be changed and should be changed to reflect our growing understanding of the implications, not of what the Democratic Party wants to have done or the Republican Party wants to have done, but as what God wants done with that original understanding that we're all created in the image of God. And so those changes can occur. The moral law, I don't see very many, if any, Jewish moral laws that should change. I don't see anything about not murdering that, that is historically connected. You can't murder, period. And so that's what I think about Revelation. So I, I want to go back to your first point, because I think this is very important. Um, there was a very famous philosopher named Moses Mendelssohn of 18th century, early modern Jewish thinker. In fact, probably the first modern Jewish thinker, who put forth a proposition that Judaism is essentially divine legislation. That Judaism, we, we would put it in our language by saying it's a way of life. And from that, you have a, um, a conclusion that is drawn or an observation that is made that we have no dogma. And many Jews believe that we have no beliefs, that beliefs are not part of our faith. But you began with a belief. And I think this is a very important idea that, that you cannot have a way of life. You cannot have legislation without a framing story, a narrative, which orients you to the universe, and tells you who you are and where you are and where you're going and what's important to you and what is the core of your values and what's the source of your values. I mean, the, the, for example, there's a wonderful source for this. 
the very first Rashi on the Torah. He quotes a Midrash from the early, early rabbinic period. We, one of the rabbis asked, why does the Bible begin with Genesis? It should have begun with the first law, with the first law given to Israel, which is Exodus 12. And, and if you listen to the question, what he's asking is, what's more important, the law or the framing narrative? And if I see that the law is what Torah is really about, I don't need a framing narrative. But what you've said, and I think is very true, and it's very important for, for us to understand, is that the framing narrative, what's the nomos as well as the logos, the framing narrative is critical to us. And in so many ways, it's what Jews have lost in this last generation. Yes. Jews have lost the sense that Judaism teaches a truth not just demands things in the way you live your life. That's of course very true. And not just demands affiliation and protection of the Jewish culture and protection of the Jewish people and protection of the Jewish state. All of that we know. But deep down, it's about a certain way of looking at the universe, a truth. It's and a religion, Ed. It's it, a religion. It's a faith. It isn't just an ethnic group. It's not just an ethnic group. But this is a revolution, Mark. I want you to, I want to, I'm pointing out Gelman the revolutionary. Well, this is true. I, I hear you. the people behind you. follow the beliefs of Judaism. No, but the idea that it's a truth is very important. Maimonides makes a big deal of this. Maimonides, you know, wants us to understand that this is a tradition which teaches a truth. And by the way, there are other truths. There are truths that this one denies. Take the one that you said, all of us are created in the equal, in the image of God, which enforces a certain quality of equality uh, on our perceptions of human beings, which forces us to recognize a certain connection among all who share the world together. These are kind of, these are revolutionary beliefs. These are very powerful beliefs. These are the beliefs that really form uh, the foundation for Jewish ethics that, that'll come that'll come as the basis of these beliefs. But the idea that Judaism teaches a truth and that what was revealed on Mount Sinai wasn't just a bunch of law, but a truth about how you see the world and where you see yourself in the world and, and, and a truth that covers even the things that the law doesn't cover. The, the law doesn't cover every circumstance and every situation, but the truth that, that I see every human being as a fellow creature created in the image of God, and that the God who created me created him, created her, created them. That is a very different way of walking the world. That changes everything in the way I walk the world. Everything. Everything. And let me say, I mean, there's a Latin phrase for this, imago Dei, the image of God. And it's, it's a big thing in Catholicism and Christianity, too because that's the best thing they took from us in building their religion, that belief that we are made in the image of God. But it's very interesting, and for this, you have to be a pulpit rabbi to know how this is, but in the streets, you know this to our students, our listeners, those of you who are not pulpit rabbis, you know this is true what I'm about to say. <clears throat> to the degree that you believe that Judaism is an ethnic group and not a religion. To that degree, the more you believe that, the less you are going to be willing to accept someone who converts to Judaism. Because what does it mean? It's like me saying, okay, now I'm Japanese. What? what you, you're not Japanese. You can't decide. Now I'm an Apache Indian. No, no doesn't work like that with ethnic groups. And so to say, if your mother, you're not, your mother was Jewish, you're Jewish, that's it, I don't wanna hear anything about anything. Well, if that's what you believe, then conversion is impossible. And to the degree that you believe Judaism is a religion, you are going to be open and joyous and welcoming to people who want to be Jewish, want to choose Judaism. And I can tell you, and Ed, I'd like you to confirm that this is true in your experience. If your experience is not the same as mine, just shut up. But basically, <laughs> I think it probably is. So here's my experience. 
you're sitting, you're talking to someone who's converting, right? And you ask them at some point, what's, what are your fears? What are you concerned about? Their main fear, will I be accepted? What about you? Is that your experience? I mean, it's not even the fear of being accepted. The, the, the catastrophic moment, and I suspect that all of us who do this kind of thing um, have experienced this catastrophic moment is she comes to see me yeah. and she says to me, Rabbi, I'm the only one at the Seder table who can read the Haggadah in Hebrew. I'm the only one at the Seder table who owns a Bible and has read the story of the Exodus in the Bible. I'm the only one at the Seder table who knows the words to the prayers that we recite on the Passover. And yet my mother-in-law will not accept me because I wasn't born into this tradition. Because I don't have, I don't know the punchline to the jokes. I don't, I don't know the inside words, uh, the secret handshake. And I didn't grow up eating gefilte fish. And she begins to cry to me. Am I ever going to be a member of the Jewish people? And you know, your heart breaks. Yes. Here is a human being who had no reason to come to us except out of a love of Torah, out of a love of our people, out of a, it's the story of Ruth, which is what's read in, on, in synagogue on Shavuot, on this holiday. Ruth had no reason to come to us except love for her mother-in-law and protection and a sense that there is a culture and a tradition and a way of life and a way of looking at the world that was of infinite value to her and willing to give up so much and risk so much to join us. Because let me make this very clear to all of everyone who's listening. You don't have to convert these days. Today, you don't have to convert to Judaism to marry a Jewish person. There are a lot of non-Jewish people married to Jewish, people, to Jewish people. If someone's coming to convert, it's out of love. It's out of, it's out of a sense of discovery of something powerful, a spiritual home, a place to be. And if we turn them away and say, well, you're not really Jewish because you don't eat gefilte fish and you don't know 10 Yiddish words and you put mayonnaise on a corned beef sand. Well, for that, you might get kicked out of the Jewish yeah. people. But otherwise... And tell them the word, tell them the word they use about non-Jewish women. Well, but this is, the, there's a vocabulary. No, they call them... It's a terrible vocabulary. It's awful. It's a vocabulary that was created when we were an oppressed people, a people that was under terrible pressure. And so a terrible pressured people creates a vocabulary of defense. And the words that we use for those who are outside of our circle are pejorative words. They're disgusting words because it was a way of pushing back, of reflecting back the oppression that we were experiencing. So the word shiksa, which I believe is derived from the biblical word sheketz, which is a lizard, something which pollutes you ritually, or shegetz comes from the same word that something, it's a pollutant, a toxin. Yeah. The word goy, which is turned from the word nation, that's what it means in the Bible, to a pejorative, to an insult, to an insult. We don't use these words anymore. These words are wrong words because we don't feel the oppression that we felt before. We don't need the, the defense mechanism. And more than that, this person wants to come and be part of our circle, to pray with us, to learn with us, to grow with us, to be at our Seder table. And you have the chutzpah, that's a good word. You have a chutzpah to turn them away, for God's sakes. So in the, book, in the Bible, there's this book of Ruth, very short book. It's read on Shavuot. And you read this book about a Moabite woman. And a Moabite was the biblical equivalent of Shiks. She's an outsider. She doesn't belong. In fact, the book of Numbers says you can't marry a Moabite for 10 generations. She follows her mother-in-law, Nomi, back into, into Judea. She engages and helps her and protects her. She becomes engaged to Boaz, one of the great heroes of the tradition, who says to her, I know who you are, and I know the quality of your soul, and you belong here with us. Don't go to another field, he says. Don't go anywhere else. You belong. He's one of the great open-minded Jews of the tradition. And he embraces her. 
And at the last line of the book of Ruth is the punchline. You read these four chapters and you, it's a beautiful story. It's a love story. It's got wonderful images. And at the last line says, and Ruth was the, was the, was the mother of Ovid, a uh, mother of Ovid, who was the mother of Yishai, who was the, who was the father of Yishai, who was the father of Melech David, King David. She's the great grandmother of King David, which means King David, the greatest of our kings, King David, who himself is the ancestor of the Messiah. Redemption comes to the world when we Jews open our circle and welcome the Ruths among us. And unless you welcome the Ruths who come to us, redemption will never come to us. You will never have the strength of King David within us. That is such a mind thing. And that's the one of the, that's the text that you read on Shavuot. I, I, that's so beautiful. And I just had this insight. That's why we read the book of Ruth, because of this point we're now affirming that if you only can see Judaism as, a, as an ethnic group, you haven't seen what we really are. You have to see us as a religion. because, And that's why when Ruth says at the end, you know, your people shall be my people. Okay, that's the ethnic group, but that's not where the verse ends. It says, your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. So maybe the book of Ruth is like a, a hidden clue. You know, I think the Torah has clues. It's saying on Shavuos, the holiday where you celebrate the giving of the law, remember that you're a religion. And remember that that being an ethnic group is not enough, because as an ethnic group you can't welcome the the uh, stranger because they're simply not part of your tribe. And that you know, and I hate it when people say, "Oh, I'm an MOT, a member of the tribe," you know, or or you hear phrases in Yiddish like "unzers," "unzers," which means us, us. And, you know, every group has this. There's in the Asian community, in the Black community, every, there is an, a, there's centrifugal forces and centripetal forces. There's forces which open us to the world, and I'm in favor of those, all of those. I'm not in favor of everything they accept, but I'm in favor of learning from everything the world is learning. And then there's, that's what's centrifugal, then centripetal, there's forces that uh, circle the wagons and force us to just put up barriers between us and the other communities. And I see that happening in America now, the tribalization of America. I mean, we went through that as Jews and early immigrants went through that. And now other people, not just, you know, other groups, are, are now all of a sudden saying, look, I'm part of my group and to hell with the rest of you. That's not e pluribus unum. There's no unum there. Out of many, one. You, how else do you make one out of many? How do you do that? You only make one out of many if there's a principle above that of the state that is the force that gives dignity to all people, and that's what God does. Without that external, supernatural, transcendent force above the state, all we have is civil society. All we have is civil society. And that's not enough. Marx, in his early essay against Bruno Bauer in 1844, Zur Judenfrage, the Jewish problem, says, the problem with civilized civil society is it teaches people to see in their neighbor the source of their limitation and not the source of their fulfillment. And to that degree, I'm still a Marxist. And I still believe that what he said was right. Because it reflects this Jewish belief that our fellow persons are the source of our fulfillment. They're not the source of our limitation. 
And the beautiful thing about that one line in the book of Ruth, she turns to Naomi after Naomi tries three times to tell her to go home. And she says, where you go, I go, where you lodge, I lodge, and where you die, I'm going to be buried too. Your God is my, your people are your, my people, and your God is my God. So here's the question. Where did she learn that? Where did Ruth, a Moabite girl, who ends up married to a Jewish boy, where did she learn of the God of Israel? Boaz. Remember, there are no JCCs Boaz. in Moab. No, this is before she meets Boaz. She's still in Moab on the way home, on the way toward Judea. She makes that speech. So there's no JCC in Moab, and there's no synagogue in Moab. You know, I never realized that. And You're this right. This is a few years before Rabbi Gelman, you know, began his rabbinate, you know? Where did she learn it? And this adds one more layer to the beautiful statement you've made, which is it's not something to be taught by rabbis. And it's not something to be taught by sermons. It's something to be taught by the conduct of Jews in the, in the lives that they live. She learned it sitting at Nomi's dinner table. She learned it in the conduct of the family that had brought her in. She learned it in the in the day to day life with the Jewish family. She learned who our God is. She learned our truths, and that's a truth she was unwilling to let go of, even if it cost her the connection with her family of origin, her land of origin, her culture of origin. She learned it, and she was committed to it. And that's where that's how she comes to be among us. It isn't a rabbi's job to go out and recruit people for the Jewish people. It's the Jewish people's job to live in a certain way that the outside world looks at us and says, that's a way of life that I have that I would love to adopt. It's a principle I would love to see adopted in the world. It's our job together as a community. Well, Mark, what are you going to have uh, tonight for Shavuos? What's your family tradition to eat on Shavuos? Blintzes, blintzes, and more blintzes. Blintzes and blintzes. And I got, I got an angle now that I'm in Boca. I got an angle on pot cheese, which is what you really need for blintzes. You can't put ricotta in blintzes. You can't. People do that. It's just. It's so for boring. those of you who are culinary experts, you will recognize the fact that we were once incredibly poor people, and yes. we used all of this lower class stuff that has now become delicacy, right? Uh -huh. Pot cheese is about 18 layers below ricotta. And yet that's what we have to use because that's what tastes authentic, right? So I, I love it. Tonight- so How yeah. about you? What's your Shavuos? Well, well, we'll have blintzes at Shul tonight. And yeah. uh, at home, we'll, uh, um, we'll, we'll probably get a little kugel action going because that's our, that's our custom as well. What's your theory, by the way, on the why Milchitz, why no meat on Shavuos? I, I simply think it's that the people who run the dairy industry bribed Moshe <laughs> Rabbeinu. Well, how much would it cost us to have a Milchig holiday? You're going to eat. You're going to eat roast lamb on on Pesach. Brisket on Pesach. Brisket, roast lamb on Pesach. You're going yeah. to have a, a roast of some sort on Shav on on, on Sukkot. On Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, you'll have... Shabbos, you have a chicken every show. Fox and bagels on, on, on Yom Kippur after the fast. Just chicken on Shabbos. The dairymen came to Moshe Rabbeinu and said... Now there's a theory we can all get from. How much can we pay you to make this a milchig holiday? Look, the serious point behind it is, on a holiday for the giving of the law, we should all try to live on the highest level of the law we can. And the highest level is that no animal should die because you have a yuntif. Beautiful. And on the highest level, your cholesterol should go up at least 100 points. It's a, it's a minor it. sacrifice. Thank you, Mark. Hag Sameach. Good Shabbos. Thank Hag you, Sameach. everyone. Join us following this broadcast for VBS Services. Tonight, our Tikkun Leo Shavuos. Come and join us at Valley Beth Shalom at 7 o'clock if you live in the neighborhood. We're going to be studying the writings of Abraham Joshua Heschel. This year, we commemorate Heschel's 50th yard site. And with the rabbis of Temple Beth Hillel and the Dad Ariel congregation, we're going to be studying Heschel and then Cantor Phil Barron, 
and his friends, the composers of the Helfman Institute, have created a set of musical settings for Heschel's writing. We're going to present them tonight for the very first time. So join us at VPS. I thank you for being part of our holiday and our Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.